good morning again. In 1856, an uh, author by the name of John Greenleaf Whittier wrote a poem called Maud Muller. And it's about a beautiful young woman named Maud Muller. And she is a, a farm girl. She works in the fields. And one day while she's working, she meets a judge from the local town who happened to be passing by. And each of them is smitten by the other. Uh, you know, the judge, as they're talking, the judge in his mind is thinking about how much he would love to escape the hustle and bustle and just be a simple farmer married to Maud. And in her mind, she's thinking how she would love to escape the farm and she would love to be living in town with this handsome judge. And neither of them express their thoughts, of course, but both the judge and the, the young woman move on with their lives. And the judge ultimately marries another woman, and Maud ultimately marries a, a poor, uneducated farmer. And for the rest of their lives, they long for and remember this, this meeting and it's in this poem that the famous quote comes, For all of sad words of tongue and pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. Now, this is today, uh, the, the point of this message is going to be making the most of the opportunities that God gives us with our lives. And we're going to be looking at the parable of the, the talents that Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 25. And we were just speaking and singing about the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit. And what changes our lives are not sermons, are not books, are not um, words from other people. What brings about true and ultimate change in our lives is the Holy Spirit. That's what brings about the, the, the transformation in, in our hearts. Now, God uses sermons and books and other people to, to impact us, but it's the Holy Spirit that brings it about. And so as I read from Matthew chapter 25, I pray that you will be open to the Holy Spirit leading. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. 
then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him who gave it, uh, and gave it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will be given, and he who will have, he will have in abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in the place there where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now the Bible is full of examples where it is teaching us to take advantage of opportunities. Um, in Proverbs 10 verse 5 it says, He who gathers in summers is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Isaiah 55, 6, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. And Jesus repeatedly called people to make the most of spiritual opportunities. In John chapter 12, Jesus said, uh, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Wasted opportunity is the theme of the parable of the talents. Um, and it's actually the second of two parables that Jesus gives back to back. The parable of the ten virgins is the first one. And, and if you remember the, the parable of the ten virgins, there are five of them who have oil in their lamps. And they're ready and waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom. But five of the, the young women don't have enough oil in their lamps. And so they have to leave and go out and search for finding more oil so that they can keep their lamps burning. And while they're gone, the bridegroom shows up and they miss out. They are locked out of the wedding feast. And that is a picture of when Jesus returns, there are going to be people who are unprepared for His return. And as a result, they will miss out. Now, the, the point of these two parables, and they need to be understood together, is we have to have a balance in our Christian life. As followers of Christ, we need to be ready. We need to be ready today, right now, that if Jesus were to return, we're prepared. We are, we are ready to go and meet Him. But having said that, we also need to be busy about the kingdom's work. So there's a balance to our lives. We can't just sit on our hands and say, I'm waiting for Jesus. I don't have anything to do. I'm just waiting for Jesus. That is an inappropriate response. That, and that's exactly what Jesus is teaching. Together, these two parables show us the balance that, that must be in our lives. We definitely are looking for His return. I pray that it's today. But at the same time, we need to be about faithful servants. And so there, there's a balance. Now, let's understand what Jesus wants to communicate through to us through this, this parable of the talents. Now in this in verses 14 and 15, uh, he's, he's talking about a man going on a journey or a rich man going on a journey. Let's be clear so that everybody understands this is Jesus talking about himself. He understood that he was going to go away and he was going to be gone for some period of time. And so the slaves, the servants, the bond servants, depending on what translation you use, those people are people who say, I belong to Jesus. I identify as a follower of Jesus. And we need to understand that if, if you believe yourself to be a Christian, uh, believe yourself to be a follower of Jesus, you are a, a servant. You are a slave to Jesus. Make, I, I, want, I want us to be clear, that is our relationship to Him. You know, that we are free in Christ, but we are still servants to Christ. 
In fact, 1 Corinthians 6.20 tells us, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now, when it uses the word body there, he's not just talking about our physical body. He's talking about our heart, our soul, our mind, our spirit, our, our entire person. That, that's the way to understand that. You are to glorify God in everything about who you are. Now, uh, the, the point of the talents is that we all have responsibilities. Uh, some have high demanding responsibilities. Some have relatively easy jobs. But the reality is, is we all have responsibilities that we are to carry out for the kingdom of God. Now, I, before I go any further, I, I want to make it real clear. This is not an underhanded or overhanded, for that matter, attempt to get more people to volunteer, to, to do stuff. That, that is not the goal here. I come from the approach that if we are right with God, we will do what we're supposed to do. And so the focus always needs to be on right relationship with God. I, I will do my best never to preach sermons just about tithing or, you know, you need to give more money. You need to, you need to be more active. You need to do these things. That doesn't work. And that's, that's not the right approach. What I will tell you is you need to be right with God. And when you're right with God, you're going to do the things you're supposed to do. And, and so that's, that's where I'm coming from. I'm being transparent with you. All right. So uh, again, let's understand. Now, the parable, it says that the master gave each according to his ability. Now, everybody is not expected to be Billy Graham or Charles Spurgeon. That, that is not the expectation. What the expectation is, is that each of us have been given skills and abilities, resources, that we are to use for the kingdom of God. And, and, and again, this isn't about giving more to the church or volunteering more at church. This is about service to Christ. Wherever that takes you, wherever that leads you, that this is what this is about. This message is about serving Jesus. Now, Jesus mentions three levels of responsibility. One talent, two talents, five talents. Again, um, this is for the purposes of illustration. When we look at the body of Christ, we need to understand that there is all kinds of skill. There's all kinds of talents. There's all kinds of abilities. There's all kinds of resources. And, and there's natural talent. There's intellectual talent. And, and then as followers of Christ, we also have been given a spiritual gifting. And so as a result, we are to use what God has given us for God's kingdom. And, and so just, just understand that as you're sitting there, be thinking about what, what do I have? What are my skills? What are my abilities? And it, you'd be surprised how many people come up to me and say, well, I really don't have any skills or talents. Uh, yes, you do. Quit. Just stop. All right. Um, you do. You have a job. You do. You have skills. You have abilities. You have talents. All right. So then we are to put those to work. Verses 16 and 17. Um, he says that they went and they put their the, the one with five talents and the one with two talents immediately put to work those talents. So again, we are to put to work our skills and our abilities. Now, here's the problem. We forget that God is God and we're not. And so what happens is we take our skills, our abilities, our talents, our resources, and we use them for us. We, we say, all right, I've got all of this stuff. I've got all of these things. I'm going to use them to prosper me, to move me forward. And this is the problem. We are servants. We are slaves. We are bond servants 
to God. And so everything we own, every skill we have, every talent we have, every ability we have, every penny we have, every ounce of energy we have belongs to God. All right? You do not own yourself. You were bought by a price with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. And so you have to have that mindset. And uh, again, what we do is we think, well, I've, I've got to do all of this stuff. I've got to feed my family. I've got to take care of my stuff. And, and the reality, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I'll take care of all of that stuff for you. Don't worry about all of that. Just focus on me. I am God Focus on me. And so when you begin to look at how am I serving God? Well, it's an investment. Everything you do for the kingdom of God is an investment. Every time you help put up chairs, take down chairs, every time you help clean up tables, every time you do anything for the cause of Christ, you are investing, spiritually speaking. You know, and, and so I, I hope to give you, a, I'm going to speak within the context of the church. But again, Jesus said, if you, if you give a cup of water in my name, you, it's as if you've given it to me. And so when you are out in the community and you, are, you see somebody in need and you step up and you say, because of Jesus, I am going to help you in this way. I'm going to help you with this issue. I'm, I'm going to sit down with you and help, you know, help you through this process. When you do anything in the name of Jesus, then you are investing in the kingdom, spiritually speaking. And that boils all the way down to when you change a dirty diaper, in Jesus' name, you are investing in the kingdom of God. You know, I bet you never, you'll never see a dirty diaper the same way. You know, you know our men's group is, is really good at helping people build a ramp because they need to, to get wheelchairs up and down or, or improve a deck or, or help a person's living circumstances. When that is done in the name of Jesus, when that is done for the cause of Christ, you are investing in the kingdom of God. Please understand that. You know, it, it's not showing up to church. That, that isn't investing in the kingdom of God. But when you teach a, a, a Bible study or when you sit down at McDonald's and over a, a cup of coffee, because that's really the only drink that matters, when you sit down over a cup of coffee and you talk to somebody and they're talking about what's going on in their life and you say, you know, when I struggle, I turn to Jesus and I, you know, here in, in this psalm, I found some help or over in the scriptures here, I see where, where this and this is really ministered to me during, during struggles in my own life. When you are helping someone come to a, a connection with Christ, it doesn't matter whether it's in the building or not. That's The kingdom of God isn't this building. The kingdom of God is Jesus and, and, and we who make up His, His, His faithful followers. You know, so it doesn't matter. But here we get to the third guy. The third guy took what had been given to him and he buried it. Now, how do we bury our talents? Well, do you have skills that you're not using for the cause of Christ? Then you are burying it. You know, understand that. It doesn't matter if you're profiting, is God profiting? That's the, that's the challenge. So, you know, if you have construction skills, or you have musical talents, or you have any sort of, of ability, and you are not finding a way to plug it in for the kingdom of Christ, then you are burying your talent in the dirt. 
That's, that's what we need to hear. That's what we need to understand. God comes first. And so everything we do, now you're saying, well, wait a minute, I've got to work a job. You know, I, I have to put in my 40 hours. Okay, I get that. But how are you using that job? Is it just a paycheck or is it a ministry field? It, it, you change it right there. You know, how are you using what God has given you? Are you using it to bring honor and glory to Christ? Or are you just using it to, to make ends meet? That's the difference. Begin to look at your life and everything about your life, your skills, your abilities, your talents, everything about you, and say, how can I use this for the kingdom of Jesus Christ? And, and prayerfully pray over it and begin to, to seek God and say, God, how do you want me doing it? Show me how I can be better at ministering and, and taking the talents you have given me and use them for your kingdom. Now, what has to be resolved here, what's really underneath all of this is the issue of lordship. We call Jesus our Lord and Savior, but is He really your Lord? You know, you, we all want Jesus to save us. We all want the promise that when we die, we go to heaven. But we forget with salvation comes lordship. Again, <laughs> we don't own us. God owns us. And so we have to have this mindset that Jesus is my Lord. What does Lord mean? Master means he's my boss. You know, he is the one who has say over my life. Now, in verses 19 through 23, we have the accounting of the fact that after a long time, the master returns. One day, Jesus is going to return. And when he returns, every one of us is going to give an accounting of what we did with our lives, how we lived and how we served. We're going to have to step up, and God is going to say, how did you use your life? What did you do with your life? The Bible says that we are even going to give an accounting of every idle thought we had. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Because I've had some pretty, pretty raunchy idle thoughts, you know, hateful idle thoughts. We're going to have to give an accounting of everything about us. And we're going to stand before God. But notice in there, it says, You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. We are going to be rewarded or punished, but rewarded for what we have done in service to Jesus. The Apostle Paul wrote about this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, okay, hear that. He is going to judge will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but on all who have loved his appearing. What Paul is saying is, he did what he knew to do with what he had. All right? And because of that, God used him and used his abilities, and he was used mightily. Most of the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul. And, and the reality is, is that God used him in a magnificent way because he was willing to submit himself and say, here I am. Now, the problem is, again, most of us are putting our agenda before God's agenda. And, and that's where we're going to run into problems with God. But think about the fact that when you serve God, and you are doing for God to the best of your ability. Again, we don't have to be perfect. We just have to be sincere in our, our purpose of serving Christ. 
And when we serve Christ to the best of our, our ability, God will take that through the Holy Spirit and He will use it and He will magnify it according to His desires. And when we stand before God, we can look forward to God saying, that's a good job. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's rest. Now, we're also going to be given responsibilities. It says there that you were faithful over a little. I'm going to put you faithful over much. We, we, I, it's going to be pretty awesome. I don't know what it'll be. I don't know how it'll be. Um, but just for the sake of our time, let's understand that we're going to have a awesome responsibility being able to serve God in, in a, the perfect state of heaven. That's good stuff. Now, this brings us to the third servant. He had received the one talent and he buried it. Now, all three servants, remember, they were all identified as belonging to the master. What it means is each servant represents somebody who is identified as belonging to Jesus. They are a part of His church. But this third servant proves that he's very different from the other two. First of all, he produced nothing. He didn't do anything that was, was useful to the kingdom because all of our works are filthy rags. All of our righteousness is filthy rags. Apart from Christ in us, we can do nothing that brings honor and glory to God. And so when a person is separated from God, even if they're part of the church, everything that is done is empty. It's, it's fruitless. It has no value. And, and the reality is, is the, this person had no, no concern for his master whatsoever. He, he represents a non-believing church member, someone who has no ident, you know, no desire to, to really serve God. They basically, they show up, they go through the motions and they say, yeah, I, I really don't care. That, that really doesn't matter. I'm doing my little church bit. That's all I'm doing. And, and again, we don't know the difference. We all look the same. We all speak the same little churchy language. We all go through the same motions. And, you know, um, Jude, uh, Judas is a perfect example. He fit right in. He looked just like all of the disciples. He talked like them. He, he did all of this stuff, but his heart was not right. And, and there are people like that in every single church. And so we need to understand that this, this third servant represents this unbelieving person. The second thing about him is that he, he actually had a hostile attitude toward the master. You know, he says, I knew you were a hard man. I knew you, you, you were a thief. You stole. You took seed that wasn't yours and you harvested where it wasn't yours. You know, he, he's basically charging his master with being an unmerciful and dishonest master. And, and this again represents the person who claims to be a Christian, but they see God as being an uncaring, unjust, undependable God. Now, how, how does that translate for us right now? It is so easy for us when we go through hardships to say, well, look at what God's doing to me. God doesn't love me. God doesn't care about me because I'm going through these hardships. You know, if God really loved me, I wouldn't be dealing with this. Oh, really? You know, um, where do you get that out of the Bible? What, what the Bible teaches is when we go through hardships, we can trust and rely on God and He will walk through us, walk with us through the hardships. But what this servant reveals is that he, he doesn't love his master, he doesn't care about his master, and he actually sees his master in a very negative light. So the challenge for us is to determine which of these servants are we? Are we, 
Are we one of the servants that are producing, whether it's a little or a lot? Or are we this servant who is taking what God has given us and saying, well, I'm, I just need to take care of me. I, I'm not going to do anything that might cause any trouble, and I'm just going to bury my talent. Which one are we? Make no mistake. Each of those servants represents a professing Christian. You know, but that one servant has a corrupt view of the master. And then the last part of this is the, the pronouncement, the judgment. Here we see that this slave is, is deemed as being wicked and lazy, and he gets sentenced. And, and again, this what is what needs to be understood. The ex, that servant didn't expect to be held accountable for, for his laziness, for his lack of, of service. But there will be a judgment. Now, our sins as followers of Christ were dealt with on the cross, but we will stand before God and give an accounting of how we used our lives, how we used our resources, how we used our skills, how we used our talents, how we used our money, how we used everything about our lives. And we will stand before God and we will account. We will understand that. And the first two servants, they were rewarded. They, they were, you know, notice the, the master didn't say, well, you could have gotten more. Why did you only get five talents? Or why did you only get two talents? That wasn't the case at all. They did what they could. That's all we are asked to do. But that one servant, he says, take the talent from him. So take everything he has, remove it from him, and cast him into outer darkness. This is a description of hell. And again, it's popular in today's world to say there's no such thing as hell. Oh, sure there is. If there's a heaven, I guarantee there's a hell. You know, you, you can't have one without the other. And what hell is, is the absence of God. And so what this is being told to us here is that when we don't care about God or His kingdom, what we're really doing is revealing our hearts. And what we're saying is, I really, I, I, I'm not interested in advancing God's kingdom. I, I'm, in, I'm not interested in serving Him. I really only care about myself. So ask yourself, are you serving? And if so, make sure that you have the mindset that you are doing it for the cause of Christ and you are doing it for the advancement of His kingdom. And if you consider yourself a Christian, a born-again follower of Jesus, and you are not serving, why? Why are you not serving? There is no excuse, honestly. And I, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be hateful or unkind. I'm just trying to help you understand this is a critical issue. We are called to serve our master. And the, so find the way to serve. And may I say, if you don't know, sitting here right now, I don't know how to best serve. Please, I, I would be happy to visit with you. I, you know, and, and let's look at your life and how you're living and what you could be doing to, to honor Jesus in, in the way you live. Let's close in prayer. Jesus, thank you. It is truly astounding when we stop to think that the God of the universe has invited us to enter into His service. You could have very easily blocked us out. You could have very easily just said, no, I don't need you. But you, you chose to include us to bring us along. And so, Father, my prayer today is that you will help each and every one of us to honestly assess our lives. How are we serving? How are we not serving? 
What could we be doing differently? Help us, Lord, to just through the work and the power and the ministry of your Holy Spirit, honestly assess our lives so that we might serve you in a way that pleases you, so that you are able to say to each of us, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your master's rest. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.